A huge tunnel is the centerpiece of this massive project and cleaner runoff will be the result. This is a historical problem from 100 years ago when there was no treatment. Okay, I think eventually it'll get to a point where it's just like houses have roofs, they'll have small solar systems added. New federal tax credits lead to a boom in rooftop solar. But even here in rainy Seattle? It's pretty cool how effective and how powerful it really can be. Seattle Public Utilities works with private firms to filter stormwater using bioswales. You know, that's cleaner water for humans and fish. That makes a lot of sense to me. These stories and more next on City Stream. I'm Enrique Cerno. Welcome to City Stream from Discovery Park. We're here surrounded by nature's beauty to celebrate Earth Day coming up on April 22nd. Since 1970, Earth Day has focused attention on the importance of environmental conservation and sustainability. It's also raised awareness and inspired changes leading to a healthier planet. One of those changes is happening along the Ship Canal, a major public works project featuring a nearly three mile long tunnel that will reduce rain and sewage runoff during torrential storms. Lake Union, Ship Canal, and Salmon Bay will all benefit, but the biggest gains will come here in Puget Sound, where a lot of polluted water runs off. Producers Randy Ng and Pete Kassam explain. swimming in the water, we're paddle boarding on the water, we're boating on the water, and coming in contact with the water, it's important for it to be healthy. But there are times where, like in a heavy rain event, it's too much water to handle. And so when that happens, it ends up overflowing into the ship canal. Almost half of the amount of combined sewer overflows that enter our local waterways in all of Seattle are occurring in the ship canal. It's not the treatment plant that's the problem, it's actually just there's just too much water in the tunnels and the collection pipes. And basically, this is a historical problem from 100 years ago when there was no treatment. So all these overflow locations, they just charge the sewage and everything right into the water bodies. We're going to remove about 75 million gallons of this sewage and storm water from the ship canal every year by storing it in the tunnel, then draining the tunnel with a pump station to the West Point treatment plant. And I do have to clarify, when people here I'm working on a tunnel, they instantly think about traffic, that we're building a tunnel to improve traffic from Ballard to Wallingford, so it's actually a water tunnel. The name of our tunnel boring machine is Mud Honey, uh, and so many people know that Mud Honey is a, a grunge band from the Seattle area. We lowered Mud Honey into the Ballard shaft in the spring of 2021. It's a really huge machine. If you put all the pieces together, it would be nearly as long as seven semi-trucks put back to back. Uh, the machine was made in Germany, and it's an international crew that operates that from countries from all over the world. Well, there is uh, people that can, can speak multiple languages. So as you can see. 50% coming from Latin countries. Maybe six years ago, I started at Mexico. So I started there this kind of tunnel with a soft material. This is my first time on tunnel, like this size. And it's amazing. I'm, I'm happy to be part of this uh, project. This is already the third year they are working together. Uh, so there is a very, very beautiful coordination between them. Uh, also the help of people that can speak multiple languages can always uh, put the, everything in common. Everything has to work in sequence. Um, there's three trains running down the tunnel. They're working about uh, 24 hours a day, six days a week. This is not a high-speed rail line. Yes, it is bumpy. It's really loud, and I think it's important to note that this is the commute. And there's about 15 people up at the machine, and this is how they commute to work every day. They commute there, and they commute out. Uh, we will walk through, you will follow me. So now we can go straight, follow me. Every tunnel is a new adventure, you know? Mm -hmm. It's never the same. I'm operating the tunnel boring machine. As you can see, the muck's coming out real quick. Uh, we're mining almost at uh, three inches a minute. 
you know, you got to counteract, you got to put positive pressure, but at the same time, not too much. He's mining, the soil's coming up over the top on a conveyor belt, and then it's dropping in where you saw that guy back there. What we're mining through is essentially a, a soil that was deposited and then run over by the last glacier about 15,000 years ago. And so we're running through very hard, compressed soil. When he stops mining, he's done for 30 minutes. Then we're gonna see very quickly these guys or gals trying to set those liners in to build the tunnel. To build about five feet of tunnel generally takes about 30 minutes if all goes well. Parts of the tunnel are underneath the roadways. Parts of our underground structures will be under the Burke Gilman Trail. People have no idea what's underneath there. And that's part of the whole realm of utilities. If you look at utilities, you don't see them. Yeah, what we're looking at here is mud honey. Our tunnel boring machine for the storage tunnel. We're super excited about this after a 22 month journey from Ballard. The machine cored into the side here, uh, right on the mark, right into our Wallingford shaft. So we're now finished with our storage tunnel. But the machine, you know, looks like it's been through a lot. It has. The red stripe is all the paint that's left from Mud Honey when the machine started back 22 months ago. We're basically going to be recycling most of the machine. The contractor will basically take most of the cutter head and kind of the uh, steel piece that you see here off. Inside are lots of different pumps, an operator's room. Those will all be lifted out and actually sent back to the manufacturer in Germany to be refurbished and to use on another project. And then actually most of the hard metal that you see here will actually be melted down locally and reused for other purposes. We did all this work during COVID. We did it as a team. We have a great contractor. The Lane Construction Company has been great to work with. It's been really amazing to see everyone working together. When we're working at these shafts, we're here for years. And we really appreciate people's patience. The benefits that we'll see from this project are going to be long lasting. It's, a, it's something that's, going to, that's being built to last at least the next 50 years. Environmental stewardship is really important to Seattle Public Utilities, so we want to improve the environmental health in our communities so that way our communities can thrive and enjoy this resource now and into the future. You always want to try to make a difference, and when you think about you're working on a project that will remove 75 million gallons of sewage and stormwater, that's something to be proud of. Remaining work on the project includes connection to the West Point treatment plant just east of us. If everything goes as planned, the entire system should be online by 2027. Yeah. Reducing carbon and their footprint, which you know are all positive things for, for customers. Next on City Stream, even with our gray skies, rooftop solar installations are on the rise. We'll take a look. Federal tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act, billed as the climate law of a generation, are leading to a boom of electrification projects across the country. That includes a rush on rooftop solar locally, even with all the Seattle rain. Michael Crow reports. Snipping away. Mike Powell all right. handles a lot of solar panels, like a lot. 35. 35 panels. And that's just one house. As an installer for Seattle-based Solterra, he's been busy hoisting 50-pound panels to roofs across town one yeah. by one. And there's that. Then it's up in the air today, high above Magnolia. You ever work with anyone that has a fear of heights? Uh, I think we all do a little bit at first. We're trying to start on that end though, right? He's worked here for a couple years now and says it doesn't ever seem to slow down, with some customers waiting several months for an install. Part of that is awareness, as more coverage of our climate crisis drives individuals to act. But it's also getting more affordable, thanks to tax credits from the Federal Inflation Reduction Act, which became law in 2022. 
over on the shores of Lake Washington. It's pretty cool how simple this technology is, but how effective and how powerful it really can be. Jeff Vestman with Artisan Electric has seen the policy impact firsthand. Uh, the demand stayed really strong all the way through uh, 2023, and uh, we saw a little bit of a dip with some seasonality here locally, but uh, with the springtime, things are picking back up, phones are ringing, and uh, the guys are staying busy. A good problem to have. Yes, it is. He says it works out to be about a 30% cost reduction for a home solar system like this, though the price tag is still significant for most, often 30 to 40 grand before rebates. But he usually tells customers it will pay back over about 10 to 12 years. And business is booming. They've grown 15 to 20% and have been on a hiring spree to meet demand thanks to those tax credits. And what does he hear from customers driving this decision to electrify? The climate stuff, absolutely. Reducing carbon and their footprint, you know? So there's the altruism, there's the, the financial payback benefit, and there's the lowering of the carbon um, footprint, which you know, are all positive things for, for customers. Which is also what motivates Amy Carpenter, owner of Solterra. Yeah, I feel super proud of the work that me and my team are doing. And of course, the excitement that our clients have. It always feels good to see someone flip the switch and go from not solar to solar. Though they do warn caution if you're considering the solar plunge. They recommend getting three bids just like any contractor and looking for reputable companies. The state trade group, Wasia, has a list of them online. And you look at who our members are, like you're going to know that you're, you're working with companies who have adopted that, that code of ethics and, and stand by it year over year. President Caitlin Borstelman is also the regional sales manager for a solar distributor, Green Tech Renewables. She says the industry is hoping for more workforce development like electricians, hanging on to net metering policies in Washington, and education for home and business owners. And yes, solar works even with our notoriously gray skies. Solar in general is on a really positive upward trajectory nationally and uh, locally we've been having actually a pretty healthy strong market locally relative to the rest of the national market for a couple of years now. A lot of that she attributes to educated customers taking advantage of tax credits, grants and other assistance. The Department of Energy says there's now over a million solar installations around the U.S. and cites a study showing solar increased home value by an average of 15 grand. It is a big incentive having that tax credit. Back in Magnolia, work is wrapping up and homeowner Glenn Thomas is excited to show his kids the new panels. It's been remarkably easy because you kind of like have concerns about putting holes in the roof and doing panel replacements, which I did as part of this project. It's actually, it's not too bad so far. Okay, okay. And Mike Powell is still up on the roof. That's a wrap, man. Glad to be doing work that matters. It's nice to do some things that we know are, are good for something. You know, I'm trying to help the energy and the environment and all those things. Harnessing the power of the sun, one roof at a time. I think eventually it'll get to a point where it's just, just like houses have roofs, they'll have small solar systems added just to help the grid. Industries Association has that list of members online. For more information, go to this website, waseia.org, and go to the Solar 101 tab at the top of the page, and then click Find and Install. The theme of Earth Day 2024 is Planet versus Plastics. The goal is a 60% reduction in plastic production by the year 2040. And while plastics are a huge problem, so is the sheer amount of waste that ends up at landfills. One nonprofit is working to change that by helping Seattleites turn trash into treasure. Producers Kathy Tui and Valerie Vaza explain. Walking into Seattle Recreative Reuse Center is like entering an arts and crafts wonderland. Every nook and cranny is packed with donated materials, just waiting to be transformed. The mission of Seattle Recreative is to promote creativity, community, and environmental stewardship through creative reuse and arts education. For eight years, crafters of all types have flocked to the store, drawn in by the ever-changing inventory, the low prices, and the eco-friendly vibe. What we really want to do is help keep usable materials out of the landfill and available for the community to use. 524 is your total. We do that by having our retail art thrift store here in Greenwood. We also have a whole arts programming wing where we do after school arts, we do camps and classes. 
all of those sorts of things. Besides the traditional arts and crafts supplies like yarn, fabric, paint. This is eight yards of fabric, $3 a yard. They offer non-traditional art supplies like mattress springs, pill bottles, and whatever this is. We have a couple of programs for free supplies. One is our free for black, indigenous, or artists of color. And then we also do that same type of program for public school teachers, where teachers can come in and shop certain materials for free once a month. First grade teacher, Wynn York Jones, uses the program to find supplies for class science projects. These are gonna be amazing. Look at all these. How many do you need? Um, about 200. The Free for Teachers program is really great. It allows me to come in and get things for my classroom that you know, I would normally have to pay for myself. Um, so it's, it's amazing. Local artists come here searching for unusual supplies and inspiration to bring their work to the next level. A lot of my work is already like mixed media and scrappy. So this is like really convenient for me. <laughs> I am in making puppets. I have a puppet studio in Georgetown. I love how it's folded. I know. It gives you an idea, doesn't it? Frequent shoppers Wendy James and Nicola Beeson are mixed media artists who are always on the hunt for just the right piece to finish a project. This came from here. This was a rubber stamp that some artists made, you know, donated. And then we find it and we're like, hey, I can put that in something. I've been coming to Seattle Recreative since at least 2017. Mostly I, I look for hmm, odds and ends and strange antiques or things from another time. Just things that inspire me. Visiting Nicola's art studio, you can't help but be delighted to see where these odds and ends landed. I picked these up at Seattle Recreative last week. Um, a few different options for an assemblage piece that I'm working on now. And I really thought it needed some sort of beads or something to hang on these cool old hinges. Everyone, in addition to coming in to shop here, should follow us on Instagram or Facebook because we often will post the latest things or very popular items or particularly interesting items. Sometimes you might not find what you're looking for, but you'll find something else. So you always find something. Yeah. Hi there. Donations keep things interesting. You never know what might come through the door. Today, it's sewing machines. So I'm just weighing the donations that just came in. We weigh the donations just because we track how much we divert from the waste stream. An average month is about 4,500 pounds of materials. That's 54,000 pounds or 27 tons a year for those who are counting. Besides benefiting the environment, Creative Reuse provides people a unique opportunity to think about things differently. I might have a cork, but I'm not using it to stop a bottle. I'm using that cork for something else, right? I think kids are really good at looking at a cork and saying, oh, it's a person, it's a rocket ship, or whatever it is. And I think adults are able to do that too. They just, you know, need a little bit more encouragement. One of the things that I love the most is when a customer shopping hears a cu another customer ask a question and then offers their own solution. All these connections help, again, build community and allow people to connect with each other about something they love too, right? Making things. We have great staff. We have amazing volunteers. Here, you want to see a great drawer that a volunteer organized today? We have built something really awesome. And I love that we keep some good stuff out of the landfill too. You know, like I like that we do that piece as well. If you're thinking, I have stuff to donate, well, you can do it and it's easy to do. Just head to this website, seattlerecreative.org and see what they accept. Then email them for an appointment. Just ahead, ever heard of a bioswale? It's a public-private partnership designed to reduce water pollution. See how next on CityStream.
Welcome back to City Stream from Discovery Park. As Earth Day nears, we're reminded just how vital it is to protect our water supply. In Seattle, private developers are working with the city to create bioswales. What's a bioswale, you ask? They are pathways filled with various types of plants, mulch, and rocks that naturally filter runoff like this, preventing pollutants from entering storm drains. Producer Randy Ng shows how the system works. The storm water that we're putting in the lake is, is contributing all sorts of bad things. And so if, if we can improve the water quality with new construction of a project, it seems like it's a win-win for everybody. in um, is, is polluted with things like uh, heavy metals, uh, oil, uh, chemicals, tire particles, um, and what comes out after it goes through the bioswale um, is a lot cleaner than what came in. It's unique because you're managing the water on a, on a private property, but it's also unique um, given its size. It's managing two to three acres of water coming down off the hill. That's something on the order of two and a half million gallons of polluted runoff. You know, if we didn't partner on this, then it wouldn't happen. We don't just look at it, you know, how can we squeeze the most profit out of something? It's what can we do that helps the community, or helps our environment, and that's important. And it feels good um, in what you do by contributing in that way. of the matter, it was going into the lake in the first place. And fortunately, we found like-minded people at SPU. You couldn't do it if you didn't have that teamwork with everyone thinking and saying this is a, a good thing and the right thing to do. If we can install these facilities all around Lake Union and our other water bodies and do it through partnerships that leverage resources um, and are really efficient and faster, you know, that's cleaner water for humans and fish. You know, that makes a lot of sense to me. Finally, we want to take a moment to remember our friend and my best friend, Matt Chan, longtime television producer, community activist, political advisor, and co-host of the podcast Chino y Chicano. Matt recently lost his fight with kidney cancer after a two-year battle. Matt could be brash and bold, but he also had a softer side, and he was a loving grandfather. On a recent episode of our podcast, Matt spoke candidly about his health struggles and about life and death. The reality is everyone checks out and the family continues on. I mean, that's what family's about, regardless of having cancer or not, or just old age. You know, that, that's just part of life. And so you just have to kind of keep putting things in perspective. I mean, I've lost all my immediate family. I mean, they've all passed away. So I understand what death is about, you know, I've been there when people have died, so I understand what that transition is like. And one of the things that he started doing is he's got very involved in the Chinatown International District community. I think the one that really stood out is that uh, you may recall about, I don't know, a year or so ago, maybe a little bit longer, that the King County tried to expand the homeless shelter uh, near the International District, the CID, and Matt was part of the group that fought it. Because the story was not about us versus the unhoused. My God, you know, who doesn't have empathy for the unhoused? Right. Um, and the shelter that we were pushing against was a good shelter. The real question was how underrepresented communities just don't have a voice. Decisions are made that directly impact a community, and the community has no voice. The long-term effects are devastating. And so I think every community needs to be heard. I mean, that's, you know, so it's not about the unhoused. It's really about being heard because there is no reason on earth that the, the you know, the Chinatown International District needs to hold the largest number of shelters in the city. There's no reason for that. All right.
there's nothing more universally Asian than a steaming bowl of rice. Matt used his storytelling skills to help community organizations with their fundraising. He also produced videos for candidates of color, such as State Senator Joe Wynn, Key County Council Member Gurmai Zahalai, Seattle City Council Member Tanya Wu, as well as Port of Seattle Commissioner Sam Cho, Toshiko Hasegawa, and Hamdi Mohammed. Matt, uh, cancer may have taken you from this life, but, you know, the thing is, you're always going to be with me in spirit. You know, the future is uncertain, but yeah. the future is always uncertain. It people, is. People don't realize it. The future is nothing is promised to you. Right. I just have a little more certainty about the finality of things. I mean, I know that, um, you know, things will end sooner than I would like, but I need to be OK with how my life has gone. And I think it's, you know, there's no regrets. That's all for this episode of City Stream from Discovery Park on a beautiful day here in the Northwest. We thank you for joining us. If you'd like to see more of the Seattle Channel programming, just go to our website, seattlechannel.org, and click on Feature Shows. I'm Enrique Serna. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs>